this meeting is being live streamed for those. So before your privacy reasons, like make sure you're aware of that and you can actually go to YouTube later and pick it up. So you don't have to worry about recording it today. It will not be a recorded version except on YouTube. As you're coming into the room, I'd like to give everybody just a few minutes to get in. Um, and we're letting everybody in now. I uh, just know that your mute is on for everybody else's, uh, just making sure everybody can hear okay. Um, and everything that I give you today, I'm gonna give you uh, copies of. Go. So we could have that um, there. We're not allowed to video. And everything's set up here. Just take just a few minutes. I'm going to have a full room. I thought everybody was going to be off for Thanksgiving, so I wanted to do this one here before everybody left. Uh, but so we're going to have a full room again today. So thank you all for taking time to come. It's a rainy day here in Georgia. We've got some bad weather. Hopefully we won't have any issues. If we do, just know that um, if we do go offline, uh, you can certainly come. just click right back on and you can come right back to the room. Okay. Excuse me, Mark. Is this going to be recorded? It is, is recorded. Okay. Good afternoon. And it's going to be recorded live on YouTube. It is live on YouTube now. It doesn't record your notes or anything today. Okay. But it, it will be available for you later. So you can just click on there and watch it on your own, own time. I like to do that when possible. Okay. Just give everybody just a couple more minutes. It slows down. I'll let everybody in the room. You are able to unmute yourself, um, and you also can ask questions in the chat box. If you, you know, if you've been to any of the meetings, you like I like to hear about your what you're looking for, and I'll try to build some of my comments based on what you asked me here today. Okay, now here's the chat box. Okay, before we get started, I'm going to give you access to the template folder. You will have um, the ability to go in and copy these. If you're not familiar with Google Drives, then get familiar. They're so easy to use and they're free. I have in here in this drive um, an untitled document that I'm going to work with a little bit later today. Uh, and so there's nothing on that one, but I have a template for a cover sheet, template for cover letter. I have a the RFP slides that we're going to discuss today, and I actually have a little pamphlet that we've written to kind of describe how to read an RFP, what you really are looking out for that I'll, I'll talk you through today. So here's 204, slow down a little bit, let's get started. Thank you once again for coming together uh, and letting me talk to you about the request for proposal. I'm gonna to try to build features today um, around AI, artificial intelligence, to help you in your process of actually writing responses and also reviewing information. And so, uh, uh, just all still learning in some of that. Um, and this is a product of GovDirections. Gov School is uh, our method of teaching. We've been doing this since 2006 on the teaching part, but have been around since 1998. Um, since, uh, let's see here, open this. Okay. Since 1998 uh, and, and serving you for research and finding the bids. And I'll, I'll just point out as people, an individual is still coming in room, this is not a recorded session. Uh, individually, you can go to YouTube Live afterwards. You can get a copy. It'll be online. They're available to you. Um, in addition, you can also um, get a copy of the uh, documents in the drive that I just gave you access to. It's freely available to you. Uh, Gov School uh, is a product where we actually teach and try to help you not only find the bits, but actually learn how to win. And uh, this is a service that we have found well, everybody really likes. And as you can see here, on a Tuesday and during Thanksgiving week, we've got about 50 in here in this room now, and we continue to let folks in. I'll continue to try to do that. If you get knocked off, let me know. Uh, if you sit there, you should be able to get back in pretty quickly um, if that should happen to you. Uh, why I do this, I'm one of the founders of Gov Directions. I've been doing this 30 plus years now. I'm also a professor at the uh, University of Georgia where I teach in a graduate program, and I help future writers of RFPs, the ones who are actually preparing the documents that you respond to, uh, I help them understand how to do that and teach them what future. I, in fact, I'm a, I do this as an adjunct professor and I, uh, about every other year, and I actually will be teaching this coming um, spring, starting up next month, uh, the first month of January, first week of January. 
Um, and so we serve in our organization about 120,000 active members who I think we just passed 123,000 uh, of you guys who want access to this. His primary objective is to find a win, but also to help uh, teach you how to actually respond to them. In today's session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through with you again at the structure of a request for proposal. What you really kind of need to look out for whenever you first see them. Um, I believe in an experiential learning process, meaning that we're going to actually dive into it, find a live one, and then respond to it together. Uh, and uh, as you know, if you work with me in any capacity, I do the same thing with you. It's better to learn by doing. I'm not one to have you sit and wait. You know, you really just need to dive into it. I know a lot of us, a lot of times I get calls from folks saying, hey, I need to wait till I'm certified, wait till I'm this, wait till I'm that. I'm like, you know, if you're in business, you're ready to go. We want you going out there bidding. Governments really need a response. In fact, we, we want to have a, most likely a $7 trillion marketplace that's coming fiscal year. The largest largest spending period in American history, uh, you know, with active contracts are really pumping now that the Infrastructure Act is in full gear. You really are seeing those out there. So it's a, it's a vital part of any private businesses um, business plan, and you should at least uh, be pursuing those. I'm going to walk through those sections, explain the importance, and this is all done through an actual um, RFP. Um, as always, I like to start off with the slides, remembering that it's supposed to be hard. If we're easy, everyone would do it. So you're here on, on this Wednesday uh, afternoon, uh, excuse me, on a Tuesday afternoon on purpose, and uh, and you're you're here to learn. If you're taking that extra step, and a lot of folks just don't do that, okay. And so understand that uh, that's a that's a plus. It's a good quote from Tom Hanks from A League of Their Own. He um, was coach of a softball team. You know, all of us like to get out there and play softball, but if you want to be the best and you know win, you got to practice and. And if it was easy, everybody would just get out there, but it's not, okay? So that's why you're here. I'm going to refer to RFPs today, just in generic form, but just know that the request for proposal is a way for governments to engage with you. Um, at all private sector companies have waged for them to lay out the, the, uh, the, what they're seeking um, and so they can treat you all equally. There's other contracting instruments that you'll see. Request for information where they're actually seeking to see, uh, you know, uh, determine if there's a marketplace looking to understand who's able to uh, to provide. The, there's like request for qualifications where they're wanting something, to know something about your company or you as an individual. Oftentimes you see these where engineering or law or, or um, there's, you know, specifically want to know about plumbers or electricians that you're certified in some way. Um, and uh, before you actually bid, okay. source of salt, trying to determine specifically if there is a marketplace. Uh, that they um, see if someone can actually provide the service or supply that they need. Invitation to quit quote is something that's usually pretty quick, uh, easy to respond to. I just looked at one with a customer with a member um, on our RP writing service where he was concerned he couldn't re re reply to it by Wednesday, and, or excuse me, by Wednesday of next weekend. I said, you, you definitely can because this is an ITQ and you are, it's not that complicated. So you see that, you'll know that that's not a really oftentimes a complicated document. Invitation to bid, a little bit more formal, same concept though, laid out, everything's laid out for you, all the specs, um, they're looking for you uh, to provide a specific item, all of you, everybody should understand what they're looking for, and so you can respond to those somewhat quickly. And then, of course, what we're going to be talking about today, and that's the request for proposal, which is my favorite. And, you know, some people say, why is it your favorite, Mark? And I said, because this is where you really get to shine, it's really where you get to show your knowledge, and that's important. Um, and as a subject matter expert, you, they're looking to you to really step in and guide the guide the government. As we know, you know, government's there for a purpose, and but they're not there to do everything and to provide every service. You know, they have to lend lean on you as a subject matter expert in your business. That's the reason why you created your business. You got an expertise, and they're looking for you to help them and to do something more efficiently, more effective. And it's a concept of you know why we contract with each other. The whole theory of the firm. You do what you do and at best, and we're going to lend on, uh, lean on you to get that done. And so that's when you you see these individual requests for proposals engaging with you as, as a market provider. And I like to start with a pure definition to kind of help enforce or reinforce, you know, why we see these documents. First, it is a solicitation, meaning that they want you to respond. OK, they're looking for a competitive um, response. Um, they're actively seeking uh, you to give them some guidance. Uh, almost always through a bidding process, meaning that you're competing against others who have some similar um, uh, aspects of, of, of their own business interests that are similar to yours. So you can, you're able to all respond back. 
in a in a in a, in a uh, formalized way. Okay, it's always done by an agency or company that's interested in the procurement of something that's valuable. Okay, there there's a reason why they do it. It's oftentimes with government, you know, they go through an elaborate decision making process. It can take it, sometimes years to get to the point where they actually issue the RFP that you're responding to. And so you understand that because this they take it seriously and it's it's a, something of value to them. And so whenever you respond back, they want a solid business proposal. They want you to take take a, a similar approach where you're um, they're initially coming to you with their request and then you're responding to them in a professional way. And you have you put a lot of thought into it and you're able to give them um, answers that they can then put, potentially move straight to an actual hire of you. And so that's the goal of that. So the pure definition there of a request for proposal is to engage you to provide that valuable service. Um, when you look at a RFP, um, you will see um, some common themes. Okay, first you can see almost always a statement of work. Okay, and that's the I think the most important part of documents. Some say some folks will say no, it's the deliverables or the specs, but I think it's the statement of work. You know, the clarity that it should speak to you. I often use this um, quick uh, note that if that when you read the statement of work, it should be usually about a paragraph or two, uh, sometimes even shorter, because, you know, the goal is to be accurate, to be brief and to be clear, clear in what you're seeking. Initially, that's the burden of the government. Uh, when you respond, it becomes your burden. But initially, that's theirs. So if that statement of work, whenever you read it, if it's not making this song sing in the back of your head, you're the one that I wanted to find. Then it's not for you. Just move on. There's a lot of opportunities. 1.5 million policy business proposals issued every year, you, you'll find something that, that that does this for you, okay? And so understand, so you're if you're really thinking through it and trying to make it work for you, it's just not the one, uh, so move on, okay? So always have that song singing to you. Uh, so when it does, then you move forward. If not, you, you save some time and keep moving on. Uh, the technical specs, Nick's next part, this is where you really see, okay, I thought it matched me, now does it really actually, can I actually do what they're asking? And there, they're listing them out. Oftentimes, an ordered process so that you can go, you step through it, and you understand what they're asking you to reply to, um, and then you'll see the schedule. And this is how the first side of it, how you can respond back to the RP. What's the timeline? You know, sometimes you'll have a month, sometimes you'll have a week, and you you need to be prepared. And I'm going to show you some preparation tools to help you get prepared to actually respond. Um, the list of deliverables, how they want you to respond. And I, I just was looking at another one this morning. There, it was really laid out uh, for the, the actual RFP. It actually had dollar numbers uh, assigned to it. So when you meet step one, you're getting you're getting $5,000. When you meet step two, you're getting $15,000 and, and so on. So sometimes they're very specific, almost always ordered, but usually driving the pricing structure of the actual proposal in order to deliver the technical specs that, you're, that they're seeking. OK, so pay attention to those. You need to be able to meet those. And I always step back and say, you know, the statement of work needs to really match you 100 percent. You know, uh, but the rest, the technical specs and a list of deliverables, then you can you can you know, if you can't meet everything, it's OK. You know, don't have to walk away from it. Um, a lot of times there, this is the ideal situation. You can get up to 80 percent, 70 percent, and that's sufficient enough to actually respond back or a way for you to step out and build a team of others who might be able to help you fulfill that 100 percent goal. Okay. So just because you can't do everything in the technical spec or the list of deliverable uh, doesn't mean you should you should abandon the project. It's my thought on that. Okay. And then of course the contract terms and conditions. When you see those, you need to live with them. Okay. Governments don't change contract terms and conditions. It's not like you and I where we can give a little bit of flexibility. And oftentimes, I, you know, in the government directions, we only have require you to have a contract. You can come in and out when you need to. And we're pretty flexible, but in government, he's going to have that those contracts, and you have to live with them. The uh, city attorney, the county attorney, the state's attorney is not going to make any adjustments for you. So that oftentimes drives your profit center. So you need to make sure that you are um, that you can live with them. The format of the proposal. This is the I want to think one of the best parts of uh, working with the government is they tell you how what they want you to do. Uh, you don't have to step back and really think about it. You know, and a lot of times when you're building or you're responding to a private company, you got to be able to really creative. Well, government doesn't necessarily value the creativity. They want it more formalized. They want it more standardized. And the reason why is they want to be able to match you uh, and compare you up against others. OK, and so that they can do that in an efficient way. Uh, and so that's important that, and, and, and to treat you all equally and so that you know what you're you're being measured against. In fact, this is one of the reasons why you'll you'll oftentimes see when you, you email a, a procurement officer during this initial 
sort of cone of silence where the bids on the street or the RFPs on the street, they don't really respond. They'll have a formalized way for you to ask questions, you know, because they want to make sure everybody is getting the same answers and everybody is, is, has equal treatment. Okay. And so that format is important. It, it also will drive parts of, of the document itself and what they're looking for in terms of qualifications and experience. Okay. And which again, while you know it's ideal, they'll always say, we want to see this level of experience, this level of qualification, and that's perfect to win. But uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's difficult. There's a lot of new ones here. I mean, I about 50% of the of the folks on this call today are, are new. Okay. And that's common. And so they understand that. And so while they ideally won't, you know, 10 years experience, they don't really ever get it. And so they have to be willing to bend on that. And so don't walk away from a project just simply because you don't quite meet their, their uh, experience level for your company. Okay. You can also make sure you draw into that uh, the length of term that you actually served in this marketplace. For example, I've been in, in the government space for 30 plus years. And so I can, I can use that. Now my company has been around for well, been around over 20 years. So um, with 20 years, that's, that's still solid. But if I start up a new area and I'm getting in something brand new, then and I come in there, I can draw back on my past experiences. Some of that's relevant and I want to pull that in there. So publication experience is important. Read into it, understand what they're looking for. And, um, and then you're able to respond back to it in an appropriate way, pull in past experience elsewhere, but also with your company. And then cost breakdown. Uh, here, uh, government, oftentimes in the RFP, they'll want that separate or, or they'll tell you that, you know, how to propose back to them. And so you want to have in your own uh, portfolio of, of details and your templates that you build, different ways to cost out yourself. Sometimes it may be the, by the hour, maybe by the widget, maybe by the day, maybe, you know, by a, a project basis as a whole. And so have that ready to go. Um, and uh, prepare, prepare so you, you're not spending a lot of time thinking about it, okay? Uh, but then you almost always break that down in a different way for the individual government to, uh, to look at. And whenever you look at cost and look at, um, you know, and other factors related to cost, you, you oftentimes really refer back to the overall evaluation criteria, okay? Because, you know, cost oftentimes is usually about 20 to 30% of the actual bid uh, re review. And I know a lot of us really focus in on that, uh, when we first start specifically, you try to understand how to do pricing, but then really start realizing after you start submitting some that 70% of the actual decision is made on other parts of it. So, you know, in order to get really uh, to, to win, you got to have those 70%, not necessarily the lowest cost. And that's important. And I always say that, you know, the first thing to remember when you're preparing a response to an RFP is that you really are trying to get past the procurement officer. Okay. That's the first person, not the decision, actual final decision maker. So the, that RFP that you respond to the document you prepare needs to make sure you, you know, you dot the I's across the T's and you give them exactly what they're looking and you, and you, and you, you get to the next stage. And at the next stage, then you get to be really creative, you know, and then you get to show your knowledge and your skills. And so you have a pitch deck ready to go that goes into a little bit more elaborate detail than just the actual response to the RFP. Yeah, but understanding that in the evaluation criteria itself, it's measured uh, oftentimes a little bit different uh, at the first stage than it is at the second stage. And so you want to always measure and run a test on yourself before you uh, submit a, a proposal back to an RFP. But here's are the areas when you first open up that RFP, the first thing you want to do is take a look at that statement of work. It's going to say, you're the one that I wanted to find to you. And if it does, then you can move along to the other parts. And then you can read through it and pay attention to those areas that we discussed. Um, you're going to always read the entire proposal. And that doesn't need to be, you know, like in the federal one, I just got a call with somebody and and uh, and we were reading this uh, federal one together. And it was, you know, the, the standard 1449 document. If you're not familiar with it, it's pretty standard. And you only you really need to fill in at about four or five spots, but it just looks overwhelming. So most, guys, most of us, when we first start, okay. Uh, and then you get past to page six, maybe, and then you get into all these reps and certs, you know, and and it looks like, oh, my goodness, I, I'm never going to do this because it's got, you know, 40 pages of stuff i got to agree to and understand. I don't understand all of it. Um, you know, it's you got to read through the entire proposal, but don't get get starstruck with that stuff. OK, because a lot of it's boilerplate. Almost all of us comply with it. Um, and then you just need to make sure that you do. But it's nothing elaborate, really. The primary parts that you are responding to are going to be uh, telling them the price and get that down first, because that's important. Um, and then you'll always pay attention to the areas we discussed. 
you know, as you're taking a look for it, always set it aside and think about it. Though. Even if it's just for an hour for something that's got to be turned around in a day. Um, I had somebody this morning wanted me to respond to one by two o'clock today. And I was like, oh, I'm not sure we can do that. Now that that's a little bit aggressive, even if you got everything prepared and ready to go. But uh, not always. Okay. So then you can um, go in and respond to them. But do think about it just for a few minutes at least, if not a couple of days. Talk to those colleagues of yours. Make sure it's a good fit. You don't want to engage with government simply because it's a bid. Okay, I, I see that a lot. I just I need to get a bid, I need to get something done, and and I want to go after this. Um, don't do it that way. But sit back and really wait for the right one to come to you. I probably have bid on a good thousand different bids and RPs in my career. I've won about three hundred and fifty of those in some thirty four states, and there have been about out of that time frame probably about four or five that uh, I won, and that was a mistake. Okay, and if I had start, if I had really took paid attention to what I just told you, I would not have got to myself in that position where I had to eventually walk away from the contract itself. And you don't want to have that happen. Make sure it's a good fit. Don't just take business to take business. Okay. And then complete the proposal, get it all ready, uh, have it pass around the, your office. Let's everybody evaluate it. Take it the scoring methodology that the government's going to use. Score yourself. Um, you're going to do just as good a job scoring it as most of anybody else is going to review it. And, uh, and just know that going into it. OK, and just remember that, you know, and timing work expands to its fill the time available for its completion. This is Parkinson's law. It's very true in contracting. OK, so if you got two weeks, take two weeks. I just finished one writing one for somebody this morning. Um, it's not due until next Thursday. I'm like, you, we got it done now. Let's just still hold it until next Tuesday at minimum. You don't want to submit it early. There could be some addendum. There could be some adjustments and you just don't want them out sitting out there for too long. OK, because you're. Your proposal is your proposal. You want to keep it kind of confidential until you actually get closer to the date. And don't wait till the last hour, which I have clients try to do that. And that's just very frustrating because it's you pushing, you pushing, you pushing. You don't want to have that happen. Uh, you want to get it in there with enough time to make sure these third-party systems don't pick up. I've got another company waiting today for a third-party system to approve them. You know, it's a barrier to entry for most companies. I'm not a fan of third-party systems at all. Um, and uh, I think anytime you put a barrier to contracting, it's, 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 it creates issues. And and uh, having someone wait, they could, they've really been waiting since Friday to get approved to bid on a contract. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and so give yourself enough time to make sure that happens. Okay. Your slides are going to be in the uh, directory. I'm looking back at some of the questions, everybody. Um, and uh, let's see here. Let's see if I can kind of go through before we get moved to the next stage here. Do we assist in writing sole source opportunities? Sole source opportunities are a little different. Um, you can respond to them whenever you can basically um, fulfill uh, the obligation that government's seeking. But a sole source, they really have already decided what they're going to do. So it's a long shot and we can assist you with that. But you're just, you're basically helping them understand that this company that they're looking at working with is not the only company. Okay. But the sole source has moved very far along. And those are documents that are, are a little bit unique, but yes, any, any response to any uh, type of contracting instrument with the federal government, state government, local government, we have expertise in working with you on that. The slides are going to be available in a folder. I'll give that to you in a reminder in just a minute. And also blessings to you, Crystal. I hope everybody is preparing for the Thanksgiving holiday. I, I can't tell you how thankful we, we are that you use our services. We've been doing this since uh, 1998, and we uh, really enjoy our, what we do. I hope we come across to the, that way. It's uh, it's it's a, a good profession. We've kind of stumbled into it. Frankly, we started this company as a way to really find bids, and it was, it was when the internet was just springboarding, and we wanted to stay on top of it. Used to back in the old days, you had to go and scour through newspapers at a library. I've been around long enough to know that. Um, and because you were in the back of the newspapers, they were advertising. Then you had to you know write to them and, or call them and get the information. Then the facts came along and they were able to fax things to you to get these hundred page faxes coming in, you know, eat up all you eat. And now it's all just so great. It's right there. And not only that, you have all these uh, tools like AI that can help you read things just very quickly. And I'm going to show you some of that. In this process of talking today, I'm going to show you how to organize things. Okay, first, use a Google Drive. It's free. Okay. There are other tools. I'm, I'm a big uh, proponent of something called Monday.com. It's actually a great tool if you want to find one that can actually help you. I saw another client using HubSpot. There's some great CRM tools that are out there that can help you organize your flow of information. Google Drive is free. We use that, that system. Um, and always, you know, sit down and sort of think about things, develop indicators of success. And we help you do that, but indicator success, these are the items that you see that's common with any RFP 
And if you see it, you will know that you're going to have a high degree of success. And it, it saves you time. So you're not wasting your 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 time on other things. For example, uh, a minor is, is oftentimes the size of the government. Okay. So if it's between about 5,000 in population to about 15, 20,000 population, I usually go for that. About 75% of the time, I can win those contracts. Um, and so that's sort of a note. Now, if it was the city of Atlanta, even though it's right here, I literally can almost throw a rocket hit the city hall. Um, it's, it's not, I'm never going to win it. It's too big. Okay. Not only that's going to be, I'm not going to be successful at it whenever I do that. Um, and so I sort of know these things when I go into it. So whenever I, and you're going to build these and try to get about, you know, what I'd say a good number is 10. I mean, you've as many as 20 indicators that you're looking for. You know, I, I kid around the other one of I specifically like to look for is, you know, where it's located at the geographic, because I have to go on location when I do my work. Maybe you don't, but I do. And when I do that, I want to be close to a fishing stream, okay? Because I'm going to take some a couple of days on the front side or the back side and do some fly fishing if I can. Um, and so that's in, that's important. You know, you be you have a work play relationship, not just it's not just the just the work itself. And so this is an indicator because I'm going to be happier. I'm going to do a good better job. And when I'm there, and, and that's always going to lead to success. Because it could be population, geographic, size of project, a specific uh, part of the work that you do. You need what they are. Lay them out. Okay, prepare your templates. You should have now. I'm giving you a couple of places in a template proposal here um, where you can, uh, I'm helping you out. Let's see here. Here's the actual drive for the templates. You can tap into it. I've got you a cover sheet. I've got you um, a cover page to get started with. Okay, and I'm gonna copy this, get the link um, here for you. Anyone with a link, copy it. Okay, let me go down, copy it. I'm going to drop it back into that chat box for you so you can get in there and get a copy of these documents. Okay. Um, cover sheet itself, ready to go, always uh, built in such a way. Okay. So you got your logo, you got the date, you got the com company name, your address, details here, you just slide them in there. Okay. You can have a, if you have a Google Drive built in such a way, you can actually just merge these together and have them ready to go pretty quickly. The logo, a lot of times they'll put, yeah, I put my logo in here. Oftentimes I see that with an actual agency's logo, logo instead. So it's just how your what your style is. The other template is a cover letter, you know, the art of a good cover letter. Um, it's the same you have a logo at the top, the business logo or your letterhead. Going in, actually taking a look at your the, who you're going to respond to, the station number, the station name, who you're going to uh, present to. Your details here, okay. A capability paragraph. I like to, this is where I sometimes I say, you know, uh, to my clients, write a song about yourself. How are you going to start it out? The first three uh, lines of the tune you're going to play. It's good. This, this is the part you're going to say over and over again. I'm great because of this, okay. And this is why you want to hire me. Get a story to, to sell your capabilities and to tell them and help and then translate that into what the government itself is actually seeking there, okay. And then always in government. You need to certify what you say. Say it's a true and correct copy. Okay, always accurate, brief, clear to the point. Three paragraphs is enough. Um, often, sometimes they want you to be a little bit more elaborate. Um, those are exceptions to the rule. Okay, but always there with your good address and you at the bottom of it. Okay, it's just a simple document to get you started there. Okay, and so in that part, keep your templates ready to go, and I'm gonna give you some other templates in just a second. Do your price research, see what your competitors are bidding, know where you're at. When you do price research though, first, set your own price. Know what it costs for you to make money, okay? If, and you should be able to do that. You know, what's gonna cost you on an average project, sometimes it's driven by um, in, in deviations of some sort where it's located. For example, I've got more labor, uh, more travel costs and so forth. Or if it's a larger project, I have more labor involved with it and I might have an escalating feature to it, things like that. But know what it costs you to make money. Governments don't want you to lose money. They don't want you to go in on the cheap and not be able to perform the work. Okay. Once you get your price set, then take a look at what your competitors are doing. See what it takes to actually win. And if you do need to shave, you know, at that point, shave your pencil, then you go back and do that. Um, and and um, and so that's that's there. Okay. Um, and I'm looking at questions too. And I'm going to share with more as just a minute. Okay. And do that. But make then do your pricing and start looking over time. Okay. And, and see where you need to be at comparatively speaking. Okay. And you don't want to leave uh, leave money on the table. I was looking at one the other day where there was four bidders and this is a square foot uh, process where they're bidding the client is bidding by square foot and they were one person was about 110 one person a company was about 112 another one was 120 and then a fourth one was i think one 
we're about 130. And then this person who won it was 62. And now that was just stupid, you know, even though they got business, I guess it's never stupid to win business, but they could have did a hundred and still won. Okay. So you don't need to shave it so much. You know, we don't want to leave money. That's not a good way to bid. At the same time, you don't need to be going in there bidding 200 when everybody else is right around that 110 range. Okay. That's just a waste of time at that point. And so you need to kind of be there. And almost always these days, I can take and look and, and see a, a pricing, uh, see a bid, and kind of know where about 75th percentile of that. I've done it a lot in my business, and you should be able to do the same way and kind of know where the average is at, the mean, where the top tier clients are bidding at, and where the lower tier clients would bid at. Okay. And oftentimes, when you first start, you got to bid in the lower tier, and then you get to a point where you're able to move around and you're getting more points on things like qualification experience and your methodologies and your approach. And then you can bid at a, um, a little bit higher price and still win. Okay, so understand that that's a, that's the valuation criteria. And so, as I said earlier, the only source of knowledge and experience. So let's just jump over here to um, to uh, RFP delivery, and I'm going to show you some tools. Here's our RFP writing service. As we say, it's not ordinary; it's experiential, meaning we're really engaged with you, actively helping you. And we started a new cohort service. In fact, we have a cohort meeting this afternoon. Uh, as a, a second grouping. And so we lower the cost for, for our clients to, you know, our biggest process here is just making sure that you have an affordable way to bid on government contracts. And that's our primary objective here, to not only find them, and but also to be able to win them and the tools that you have necessary. And then we have our individual service, which is by far the most uh, popular. And I just noticed uh, that's misspelled. This is the first time we launched this page today. So somebody needs to go in and fix that. I hope somebody's listening here. Well, I'm going to go in there and fix that. Spelling, that's not good. Um, and so we'll, we'll do that. But here we go in your account. You can go in if you're at uh, RFP Delivery, if you're using govdirections.com, RFP Deliveries, uh, we think is a better presentation. It gives you more uh, intelligence methods to find things as well as actually geospatial analysis to go out there and see all the active bids that are, are available at any given time. It's driven by where you're located. I can see here I'm in Atlanta. I'm very close to City Hall down there. Okay, but I can then scan out to a complete view and see all of the individual contracts that are available at any given time and then drill into those. Okay, and as you can see, this is a Google mapping system. So it draws you and pulls in there and, and see there's a lot of bids. We're in 74 countries and now, and so you can come and see opportunity all over the place. Okay, and so our mapping's there. It will pull in as well in a different view and gives you a big global uh, approach to it. Come in and actually separate by industry over there. Okay, but in your uh, main folder, as you drive into it, um, you can come in and you can uh, take a look and you can use your filters. Filters here, you can search keyword within filter. For example, I do compensation study. Okay, I just can choose that as a mechanism. Anybody? Okay. Okay. That's correct. Um, somebody's asking about the RFP template. It's not, there's no data on that one just yet. Okay. And I'm going to uh, share with you some in just a minute. Okay. Compensation study, I go in, and then I might look within my industry okay, that I'm watching. Maybe I want to just check ma management studies as well as human resource studies. Okay, So this is basically saying I want these two words in a Boolean search deep technique. I'd be using an or is expansive. And in order to come in within these two categories, now if I was in doing set-asides, I can do an advanced search here and choose those. Set-asides only at the federal government level. Okay meaning that your company has to be have one of these search certifications, woman on, for example, total small business, hub zone, and you have to have the NAITS code associated with it or you cannot bid, okay? And then, of course, I don't want to be that specific. I want to be more global, and I'm just going to do the first by the categories. Once I click my safe filter, it's going to uh, always be there for me, but I can come back and look. It's going to give me those contracts ready for me. Just as a quick note, I went back. If I go into my account, once I decide what filters are the best for me, if I'm at the dashboard, click on home, or actually the icon or the human image always takes me back here. Click here, I can see my filters, and then they're there. That's the one I just saved. Okay, apply that filter. It'll run again for me at any given time. You can check this maybe before you leave in the afternoon. We're adding about three bids every minute. And so it's important that you always check, stay on top of it. Here's one in Texas. Here's one in South Carolina. Here's one in California that I could potentially lean, lean on. Okay, I'm just going to use this as an example. Okay, so let's go over there and see what's going on in South Carolina. It's close to me. That's good. That's one of my indicators, Beaufort County. I'm not going to look at this one here because I don't have a link. It came out of the newspaper. 
Um, and I may not find it. Let's just go see what happens there. I'm going to go into Beaver County. Here we go. And I'm in the business area. And usually this might mean that there's going to be an issue with it actually related to the actual um, uh, having a register with third party of some sort. Here at the site, bid opportunity. Okay, I see that. Okay, give me some instructions. I'm always going to watch for those instructions. And this is live. So, is it current view sealed? Quest for quotes. The protest. Okay, Let's see if this is it. Here we go. Always not the easiest thing. It is one of those third. Uh, these third party systems are such a barrier sometimes. Here it goes the bid. Okay, go in. I have to log in to view documents. Is this the view a public public document? Not always the best. So we uh, let me see if I've got an access to this account. I am I not have not. I'm gonna go in and yep, not not as not as gonna be there. Let's go back and find another one. Yeah. If you ever get to that point, we will actually pull that for you. Just give us a call. We'll be glad to go through and actually do that for you. Open this one up instead. Let's go in here. It's gonna be in Del Rio, Texas. I like Texas too. I do a lot of work in Texas. Go on in. Oh, here's my document. A little bit better. I like these when they're opened up and then they get more, they get better response, they get more responses. It, it's better for the government to do that. If I've got a question, I'm gonna email Luis there. Okay, here's my document. I'm gonna download it. Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is open that up. And what did I tell you we're gonna look for? First thing we're gonna look for is the actual scope. Okay, it will give me some background. Here I'm actually gonna start picking up on some um some indicators okay 37,000 population i will go up to about 50,000 so that's an indicator for me okay it's it's in a good location it's near with san antonio and a great place to you can fly into i can get in there pretty uh, inexpensively it becomes cost effective so this is an indicator that i'm watching for um it talks to me about the type of government it's council manager form of government that's important it's how things are decided. You learn that about the actual type of governments. And uh, and so this is a, it's an ideal environment for me to work in. So three indicators that I've got is that one of those is the type of government. Okay. And going in there and I've got number of employees. That's another indicator. They're 450. I usually don't go over a thousand. So I'm up in a, in a good um, number. They're about mid range. Okay. So step into it. Here's my objective, what they're trying to accomplish. Okay. This is really kind of the scope. Okay. As well if they don't have a pure scope of work to find. So you don't really always see it called exactly what I told you earlier, uh, but we're going to look for it, okay? And so what they want me to do is to help them with a classic comp study of public employees is exactly what I do. They didn't mention the word union. That's not something I'm concerned about. And uh, and so that makes it more complicated. So I, I'm still, this is something I'm still interested in. There's a comparative analysis. I do these things. Uh, this is perfect for me. So I'm continuing to work here as a scope, okay? And so here in general, what they want me to accomplish I'm going to be working with the city management. I'm going to provide for a comprehensive evaluation. These are all the things that I do. Okay. So it's a project that I'm going to be interested in. Okay. And so what I would do at this point is go in. Okay. And I'm going to go to my member drive area. Okay. Here's where you, we have folders set up, members that we work with. Here's a sample folder. Um, when you have a sample folder, way I organize it, I always have one folder for RFP processes. This is how the business I'm actually going to be working. And then I have folder where I just stick files. For example, my capability statement's always here, a logo that I might need to actually build uh, an um, a individual letterhead or maybe to use on my proposal will be there. Okay. So these are all uh, available. Um, I want to have it organized. So you may organize yours a little bit differently. This is the way I organize mine. In here, I'm going to have my RFP components. These are going to be pre-built items that I'm working with. Okay, you're going to see common in each of those. We talked about some of these, you know, the executive summary. What do I do? My qualifications, my methods, my certifications, my forms, my performance, past work that I've done, examples of work, things like that. Once I do one form, because they're going to want a lot of forms. I'll show you just a minute deck, so I'll save a lot of them. And so I want to just save them here, so I don't have to redo them all the time. I'm going to speed up the process, those things that are sort of common over and over again. Once I ask an answer a question on a method or a deliverable, I can save it here. I can always come back to it, okay? And then I don't have to rethink it all the time. I may want to improve it as time goes on. And, you know, I might have 100-plus questions. I probably have 200-plus questions in my true folder that I can just go to very quickly 
and just get the answer to the question and uh, drop it into my document. This helps me speed up. In my executive summary, I might have it structured in different ways. So, for example, the one uh, I might have executive summary now just for Texas. I've worked in 35 states, and then I, I would have a, a summary of how I've done work in each of those states and sort of drive that for them. Okay. Um, so, have it ready to go. My component and my interested book here, I'm going to have active, those I'm working, those I've submitted, stays there until I get a contract. That guy's going to win. Okay, and then I'm gonna have a no bid folder. No bids when I'm gonna look at something like that. When I just looked at, and if the population had been too big, something not. You know, I've already took it. Already went to the trouble of looking for it and thinking about it. And so I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and measure it. And and I'm gonna kind of understand why I chose not to do that. And I'm gonna call this really my um, learning folder. Okay, and because occasionally I'm gonna actually bid on some, but I'm not gonna win. That's kind of rare for me, but it's gonna be common for you to when you first start. I'm just I'm kidding. I, I lose a lot. You have to lose a lot, win a lot. Okay. So, so, but you, you, um, know that whenever you, some, if you do lose, it's not always your fault. Okay. In fact, if I, I would probably say eight times out of 10 has nothing to do with what you've done. Okay. It's usually the decision making process at the local government level or the state agency. Somebody gets involved, there's humans involved. And so they'll make decisions that can be influenced by emotional factors, social factors, all kind of other factors that have no logic to them. In fact, one of my favorite quips that I'll sometimes re, uh, re repeat is from um, Professor uh, Ronald Coase, and he talks about the Coase theorem. And somebody in his last lecture, I think one of his last lectures, he was um, asked about you know the concept of how are humans evolved in decision making, and what do you think like humans in general? And he's like, you know, truth is humans are stupid. Okay, you know, he just said it in a funny way, and he's like, they're just not logical. Okay, and oftentimes they make decisions that just have nothing to do with logic. Uh, and that's just the truth. And so just to know that it could be, you know, the color of the shirt you have on that day. It could be all kinds of different factors that just influence that. And uh, and hopefully it's not, but it does happen. So I want you to wear that. But here are my active folder. What I would do at this point, I'd go in and keep it organized. And I'm going to start my new uh, folder and I'm going to call it, um, let's see, it's Del Rio, Texas, I think it was. Okay. And that bid was due on a specific date. I've got too many windows up here. December 18th. I got a little bit of time. Okay. I'm going to put my date there. This helps me out. That way, when I'm looking, I know which ones I've got to focus on first because I might have in my active folder probably about five or six of them going at any given time. Somebody told me, I said, they said, I, I heard on YouTube, I watched a YouTube video. They said I got to be bid on about 30 of them. I'm not really a big believer in that. You don't want to have that much is too much of a scattered shot approach. You need to have ones that really going to meet you. Once you really got to get shot at, if you don't, you need to move on and really focus in on that. So two or three of them are working at any given time. I think it's a good, a good number. Okay. And so you have that. So I open this up and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take that document. Okay. Jump back over here. I'm going to download it. In this case here is export as a PDF. Yeah. And then I'm going to look at my folder. And I'm going to drag that document so I can share it. Whatever else I'm going to do, I'm going to give them a quick access to it. Okay. Drag it in here, and it's going to be there for me. I'm going to open it up on here. And we start working it from this point. Okay, now, so I already have this document opened, okay, over here. So I'm gonna actually just drag it over here so it's a little bit closer. I got too many windows here, okay. And then I'm gonna start pulling out some specific information, okay. As I do that, the first thing I wanna do is take a look at the scope, okay. Again, remind me what they're trying to accomplish. It will tell me how I communicate. What I'm going to do with it, my deliverables are kind of being built in here as well. And I'm going to start looking for, um, here are all the itemized listings. Okay. Proposal instructions. Okay. Now, I promised you guys that I would actually pull in some AI here. So I'm going to open up another tab, one more. I'm going to drag this one over here again. I get to keep it close. Okay. 
I'm going to grab this URL that this document's at. And I'm going to go to chat PDF. Now you could do chat GPT, other tools. There's more, more and more tools as you know, competition starting to grow and the AI field. And I can go in here, I can drop in my URL. And a lot of drama, in fact, I think with uh, uh, OpenAI and, and Microsoft and others following on the internet. But here you go. There, they didn't actually pull that up. So usually it works straight away. Let's just go right here, drop my PDF here, since it didn't open up. Yeah. Sometimes it goes straight to the URL. Uh, it starts here, I had to drop in the PDF. Okay, so it starts me out, prompts me some questions. So it starts engaging me, some thinking process. So I, you know, I encourage you to, to use these tools because it does allow you, it helps you in your thinking process with things. And so it gives me some questions. What's the purpose of the study? How many positions, stuff like that. What I'm, and a deadline is a good one to start with. So I'll just say, okay, I'll, I mean, what the deadline is. Okay, deadline's December 18th. Okay, so I might want to come in, ask, ask an additional question. Okay, and I've got to move on. So here you ask the question, you know, what is the format of the proposal? You know, I could, I'm smart enough from this document, it's not 200 pages long that I can actually go through and, and figure that out myself. But, you know, I might want to do it just to make sure. Oh, it doesn't contain a specific information in the format. Or it does state the proposal should address all the points outlined in the RFP. So that's something important. And, you know, you may want to say what, what uh, points are most important. You know, it's still growing. Hey, I'm a big believer in doing it or doing it with the old human way. Okay. So just know that uh, it's there, but it's not always the, the answer to everybody's questions. I think technology is great to, to a level. Okay. So we go in here and what we're going to do then is we're going to start a new response. Okay. Go in, create, share. We'll call it response. Now, I'm always going to have some basics here to start off with. First, it's going to be my cover letter. And then it's going to be my cover sheet. Okay. And then it's going to be my proposal. Okay. And what I usually do is go ahead and insert. Okay. And I'm going to break it to a section break each time. Okay. Just helps me in my formatting, keeps it all organized. And then I can have different section parts if I need to. May not eventually at the end. I may come back and drop that off in my proposal. Go ahead and just add me a table of contents. It's important when you're working with government, take it take it seriously. You know, um, help them understand what you're offering and keep it organized. Okay, and because they're going to be passing around to a lot of different individual individuals, your your table of contents is always helpful. Your cover sheet just always it, it sells your company, helps them understand um, who you are. Okay. And so you got that document there. Um, and so we have that. It's just the cover sheet. Okay. Drop it in. Okay. Then I've got my cover letter. Ready to go. And now in yours, you're going to have it already pre-filled and you're using your own name and so forth, okay? So we got it. I've already, look how fast we got this done. It's ready to go. Okay. So you will have your name and all everything in here that I'm just going to put in the contract and office or details like that. Okay. So in my proposal, okay, but yeah, I'm going to take a look and see what they actually want me to do. Okay. At this point. Basic information requests. So see, they told me they wanted a cover letter. So I've got the cover letter done. So I'm going to have my approach, my description, my expense, my cost of services. Okay. Copy that. Okay, we in. Drop it in. Okay. First section. Approach. Second section. Description of project team. Fourth, my references. And you know what? The first thing you should do when you really get serious about doing business with anybody is get your references ready. Okay, government's going to check your references. So your references should always be in this format. First, in this case here, they want five. Okay, so you got to build them up. 
First, it should be those you contracted with. Excuse my typing, I'm not the best typer. Contracted with or for. Okay. They hired you as a company to do something, okay? Public first, private second, okay? Now, the first question I look over there and see, I bet you he's going to say, I'm new, I don't have any references. You know, I haven't contracted anybody. Okay, I get that. Everybody starts new. That's not a reason to give up already, okay? So second, those you worked for in the past. Somebody who knows you do a good job. Okay. And once again, in the order, if you work for a public organization first, that's great. Next, private. Okay. So sort of reverse what you might think. Okay. So you public and private. Okay. Now, once again, uh, I've only had one job. I hadn't got to five yet. Okay. So here, go in. Those who can speak the good character. But you got to get some references. Okay. Got to build them out. And you got to get five, a minimum here. I usually want to have seven to 10 for ready to go at any given time. Um, and if you don't, if you don't have this, I always just kid around and say, ask mom. Okay. Got to have some references. Somebody's got to give you a reference. And when you do that, you need to build them in such a way that you're saying who, why you know them, who be in the contact to. Okay. Don't forget that. Don't just tell the name, it's how to get in touch with them. It needs to be a good contact. Why? When? Where? And uh, what? Okay, that is descriptive. And it needs to be a story. It don't just needs to be a list. A lot of times I just see a trait, name, name a person, contact. You need a description of what you did for them. Okay? And hopefully it ties back to, into this process. Now, eventually, you're going to get to a point where you got 300 contracts. And then you can say, and here you're going to actually tie it to, you know, in this particular case, governments in Texas or city governments in Texas. Be very specific. I've got I've had about 10 clients in Texas or cities. So I can go specifically to cities. Okay. And so that you get very specific to the to the it's not just your best con uh, best reference. It's also one that has a tie to what you're doing. Okay. So that's your reference section. Now when I actually go in, I do this pretty quickly. And I go ahead and just set it up because I'm not um, I'm not going to spend all day doing every single proposal. I'm going to go in and organize it. My headers, this would be a header three. Description of team, I'm going to have that ready to go. My whole team's going to be ready. I'm just going to drop it in. Okay. Insert. Uh, I'm going to go in and actually uh, do another header three. And then my, my uh, references. Okay. And oftentimes I want you to have resumes too. So you want to have for your team, anybody associated. And I would just point out, it's not always just your um, employees. It could be 1099 folks and other others who are um, who are helping you. Okay, it's part of the individual team that you're working with. Okay, and then my references. Oftentimes, I'll also make them a header four. Okay, reference one, and reference two, and so forth. Okay, and then you just pick this. Another head. Why am I doing this? Because whenever I set this up, it's sort of it's doing the outline. Okay. And it's going to help me. And not only it's going to give me encouragement that I'm actually achieving something. I haven't really spent a lot of time thinking here. Okay. And then I can go back in and then I can uh, have, whoops, sorry about that. Okay. And I can take that Google table of contents and look at there. I've been accomplishing something. I've already got four pages. I got four sections. I'm doing something. Okay. And here the government's going to tell you what they want. Okay. And I'm going to have subheadings here, okay? Means, methods. Okay. I need to address everything that the government is telling me because this is how I'm going to get the points to win procedures, okay? And then I'm going to also go in and label those for subheading of the subheading, okay? And it's going to keep me, keep me moving, okay? Sometimes, you know, nowadays with this, we can actually go in and, and even on Google, they have a writing assistance, okay? Suggesting, viewing, they'll give you hints you can write out. And oftentimes the easiest way to write is just to start off, I am able to do this, okay? And start flowing what you want to. Then let, then let Google or any kind of intelligence uh, clean it up for you, okay? So you don't have to worry about it. Save that answer because you're going to use it over and over again. Okay, this is going to go back into your in your um, in your components folder under your methods and and uh, 
and deliverables. Okay, and so we have that there. And that's how you lay out an actual proposal. Your costing, here they want to schedule billing rates, okay, not to exceed, but you always make it easy to understand. You know, oftentimes I'll go in and just like insert a table. Okay, you don't want the government really searching um, for information. Okay, you want to lay it out. And so the first thing might be printing cost. Okay, and it's a hundred dollars. Okay, and then the next thing is the attendance at meetings. Okay, if they weren't broken out. Okay, okay. and you know it's a thousand dollars per meeting. Okay, clarify, clarity is important. Okay, so, so always be clear in how you get answers to things. Give it a table. Okay. Go in, give that a heading, okay? And it's gonna be on your document again. So they can go straight to it. When you lay out the proposal, they look more interesting costing, they'll be able to tap on that and go straight to it. Okay. So that's how I sort of, that's how I lay it out and, and, and uh, using both methods of just true writing as well as artificial intelligence and others, okay? So let me get back over here. I got all these people waiting to still get in. I'm so sorry, there we go. And I'm going to look at some of the questions that you have. You start asking some questions. At this point in time, I'm going to terminate YouTube Live so that you can uh, ask questions directly of me if you'd like to. But that's what I'd hope to accomplish today with our time. I'll come back to these. Uh, let me just go real quick to the actual uh, slide. Okay. And just know that you can, um, uh, we uh, appreciate your attendance. Um, you're always welcome. And I thank you for joining for those who don't want to stay for the Q and A part, but in the Q and A, okay, go in and take a look at some of the questions you got. Um, will this meeting be available for viewing later on? Oh, it is. So you go to YouTube Live, excuse me, YouTube.com/slash/govdirection, 